Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today as we begin with the CCMB's public lecture on Nobel Prize for Medicine 2023. How many of you have been to CCMB before or is this your first time coming here? Raise your hand if you have been to CCMB before. Okay. Half of you at least have been to CCMB earlier. For those who have not been, CCMB is Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. We are a premier life science institute and our scientists, many of you, uh, many of our scientists are in the audience today. Um, they, they are passionate about understanding how living cells and living populations function. They have the tools and the means to look into the cells, to manipulate those cells, the proteins and genes inside those cells. So that's what CCMB scientists essentially do. And through the knowledge that they, un they gain from these studies, they also seek to develop technolog technologies that are useful for the society. And today's topic of the lecture, the mRNA vaccines, fit really well into this space of understanding fundamental science of cells and also developing something that is useful for society. This year's Nobel Prize for Medicine uh, went to Kari Kokatlin and Drew Wiseman and while they got the prize, it was also a tremendous point for us to be happy because CCMB also, in its efforts towards mitigating COVID-19 pandemic, was able to develop an mRNA uh, platform, uh, platform in our own institute as well. And this was made possible by Dr. Madhusudan Rao, who is also speaker for our day today. Dr. Rao has essentially been a protein engineer. He has worked as a scientist for about three decades in, in CCMB, where his, fo his research focus was on developing gene delivery systems and on engineering newer kinds of thermostable proteins. And after that, now he is the CEO of Atal Incubation Center at CCMB. At this incubation center, where they incubate a lot of early stage biotech startups, they also are able to catalyze technology development by putting together CCMB scientific expertise, the cutting edge research facilities that we have, and the agility of these young startup companies. The mRNA vaccine development work really is, is an apt example of bringing all these exp expertise together. And Dr. Rao will tell us more about it today. Before I let the mic go to Dr. Rao. I'll just tell our audience that the talk will be about 45 minutes long, followed by a question answer session, and then we'll all go for refreshments. During the refreshments, we'll also hap we'll be happy to have you interact with Dr. Rao more intimately. With no further ado, I'll invite upon Dr. Madhusudan Rao, our speaker for the day, for the lecture on mRNA vaccines, a checkered journey of a powerful technology. Thanks, uh, Somdata, uh, for the introduction. And good afternoon to each one of you. Uh, I've been in CCMB for a long time. So one of the things that we've been busy uh, last year was uh, I'm part of a team that uh, looked at uh, <coughs> doing mRNA vaccine platform at CCMB. That's one reason why I'm here to speak to you about our experience. And more importantly, uh, to talk about the the this year's Nobel Prize given to Dr. Catalina Carico and uh, Drew Weisman. The purpose of this kind of interaction with you is more to talk about what happens, uh, how, what was their life, how did they do it, what kind of things they faced, how did they make this happen. These are all very interesting because we want to always look at when you talk about somebody has done something, we want to see what are the, the story behind the discovery. What kind of troubles they faced, what clicked. Is it luck? Is it pure perseverance? What works? I mean, this is, these are some of the things that we would like to know, more because we also want to, want to do something similar. We want to know how things happen elsewhere. So can I tweak my own, own thing so that I can do something, get to do something like that. So this next 30-40 minutes, I'll be telling you a bit of a science, a bit of a background of their lives. And uh, let's see how, uh, the, how they made it work. If you look at uh, <clears throat> all of us, probably if you're a biologist, familiar with these two phases, 
Dr. Kariko and Dr. Weizmann. He is an American by birth. She is a Hungarian by birth. And this is the statement made by the Nobel Committee. What it says is, for their discoveries concerning nucleoside-based modifications. In fact, that's the key word of a discovery, of their discovery, that enable the development of effective mRNA vaccines against COVID. So the discoveries by the two Nobel laureates were critical for developing effective mRNA vaccines against COVID-19 during the pandemic that began in 2020. Through their groundbreaking findings, which have fundamentally changed our understanding of how mRNA interacts with our immune system, the laureates contributed to the unprecedented rate of vaccine development due to one of the greatest threats to human health in modern times. So, uh, this is all said and done, though, uh, if, as Indians, probably none of us may have taken the mRNA vaccine because uh, India didn't have the kind of a deal with these companies to buy them and use it among the, I mean, to vaccinate Indians. But we have our own homegrown ones like Covaxin and, uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, the uh, Serum Institute one. So these two are actually completely helped us. So we could deal the, vac the pandemic in our own way. So when you look at mRNA vaccines that uh, the West has developed, especially by two companies, uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech, these two companies came up with this vaccine, which probably sold, more, I mean, which was uh, used in vaccination of more than 3 billion people, because each dose has to be given at least three times. Most of the Europe and the Americas have used it extensively. So it's a extremely successful one. If you look at the pure numbers also, uh, these two vaccines are much more efficacious, 95% plus efficacious, compared to the other vaccines. Right? So, I mean, other vaccines are not bad. They were around 90, but that doesn't, I mean, you know, they are still better. That's all I'm trying to say. So, their protection is pretty good. <clears throat> so, the, if you look at briefly their history, if you look at Drew Weisman's history, he is an, as I said, he's an American. He's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Brought and brought, up, brought around the <coughs> Massachusetts area. <coughs> and he's also associated with uh, the very important figure during the COVID time in US, Anthony Fauci, which probably some of you may have heard of it, because he is the main spokesperson for COVID, uh, American efforts in COVID. Right? So he worked with him. And he is a very stable person, uh, you know, very disciplined. He doesn't do much interviews. He's focused on his own work, that is RNA biology and immunology. He's primarily an immunologist. And then apparently what people say is, when you interview him, he would look at you and then make sure that he understands you. He, you understand him very much before he goes to the next sentence. Which also tells you that he's a very, you know, very, uh, uh, his conversations are very measured. And when you look at, Kariko's life. She was born in a some place, uh, some 70 kilometers or 70 miles from Budapest, Hungary, in a very small village. Father is a butcher. Very lower middle class. Apparently, they don't have running water or air conditioning. That's what some of the biographical sketches say. But she was excellent in her. She has excellent interest in science. She was one of the top three. Uh, students in Hungary itself at a high school level. So that made her go to the next level. She did her master's PhD in a in labs where uh, there is a lot of enzymology is involved. And then she was working in a, in a particular research, biological research center where she was employed. And apparently the government didn't have funds to support it, which in a communist country, it is a bit of a surprise because they support all these activities very well. So when the whole thing stopped, she has to look for her own self. She's married, she has a kid. So she looked west. So she applied for the universities in US. She went to Temple University. She got a postdoc for $17,000. And she didn't have money to go. So she sold her car, I believe, and took some money. With a daughter, she went to US. 
and then she spent a couple of years there, did a couple of postdocs here and there, and then slowly she, with her own perseverance, she's always interested in RNA. That's for sure. She's interested in nucleosides, RNA and all that. Her work always led to something related to nucleosides and RNA biology. So she kept on going behind that. She worked on interferons and things like that. Then finally, she ended up in University of Pennsylvania as a some kind of a tenured position. And her perseverance, I'm talking about these are all in 80s, 80s, 1980s, and 1890s, 95s, in that period. She was working at RNA and she believes that RNA has a lot of scope because she read some papers, which I'll talk to you. And then nobody was interested because people realized that RNA is not a very, uh, very therapeutic molecule because it's very short-lived in the body. The RNA is very degradable. There are several issues with it. So when you go to somebody and say there is some very interesting technology based on uh, RNA, they are not excited. They never gave her money. At one point of time, they asked her to leave. Either leave or take less pay. She comes from Budapest, Hungary, and she knows what America is in terms of offer. So she thought staying back is more important than going into some kind of a corporate job. She persevered. These are all we are talking about 1995 kind of a time. And obviously, as I said, RNA was not a very exciting molecule as a drug. Not many, not much money is coming for coming to it. So she was dabbling around. That's when she met, I believe, because Drew Wiseman also works in the same institute, university. Both of them work on RNA. They kept talking. So these talks have led to something, a mutual, because both of them don't get grants, uh, not much. So they started talking more about it. That's when the whole work that led to the Nobel Prize emerged. In fact, they used to talk about a common photocopier, Xerox machine. So because they don't have own one, they have to walk to another place in a corridor and then wait for others to finish their Xerox. That's when they start talking more and more. That's what led to the, uh, their collaboration that lasted almost for 20 years. So this all of us know. I mean, this is something just to tune you to the argument, uh, our conversation of the DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein. And then if you look at these structures, the RNA, all of us are familiar with these structures. I just want to draw your attention. The, the molecule, the nucleoside in RNA, that is uracil, uh, which gets incorporated, which is not present in DNA. The rest of the three things are same. I'm going to talk about this person, Robert Malone. He's from Sakin Institute in, in, in California. Robert Malone, I, I want you to look at the date here, 1989. This is his notebook. He has done exactly what Karikon Weissman did almost 15 years before. His idea was whether if you take mRNA and put it into cells, does it make protein? That protein can be used for something. Usually, initially, we put do some kind of a marker enzyme to do it. So he has uh, some kind of Xenopus eggs with him. So he put it in them. It worked very well. It made the protein. And he was very happy with his work. And as you know, in California area, San Diego, uh, these uh, Sakin Institute, all these places are very, uh, very hot places for biotechnology around that time. There are so many interesting people, so much of interesting work being done. So that time the mRNA was not made. It was isolated from cells and then purified and used. Right? So it was a very interesting times. So then he, all of us also know RNA is a, a, a is nucleic acid, it's an acid. So it has a lot of negative charges on it. So how do you send a negatively charged polyanion into the cell? So he came up with an idea. There was another company called Vical. Vical company makes 
lipids that can bind to nucleic acids. You know, I used to work with another colleague of mine in IICT, uh, Arvind Chaudhary, who is not here now. Uh, uh, we used to work together to make these lipids with positive charges to deliver DNA. But here, they used these molecules to deliver RNA. Foreign comes into the body. If the pathogen comes, it looks at it and then does something so that the pathogen is neutralized. Right? So, there was the around, around 2000 or so, there are a couple of papers that came about tall like receptors role in, path, in pathogen defense. Okay? <coughs> so, what this is the story where from here what Kariko and Weizmann did it begins. What they have done is, you know, <coughs> uh, uridine, all of us know, their main contribution is in pseudouridine. Pseudouridine is also known. In fact, it is abundantly present in our tRNA. It is present in many other uh, ribosomal RNA also is present, but not in natural mRNA, messenger RNA. So the difference between that is, this, this is a CN bond, this is a CC bond. That's a difference. The body can make, convert a uridine into pseudouridine, but there are a lot of enzymes that do the part. That's not a problem. And there are several other modifications that are possible. Nucleosides can be modified, there are several of them in our own body, even our own tRNA and things like that, but not in mRNA. So, <coughs> What Carico and Weizmann did was they started, they wanted to understand why these cytokines come in big way. And they started injecting different RNAs. They took tRNAs, they took mRNAs, ribosomal RNAs, started injecting into the mice and then looking at the cytokine response. When they did that, they are not seeing much cytokine response when they did tRNA taken from any E. coli or something else, something else. That was a very interesting finding. Why mRNA gives you such a cytokine? Because that's one reason people realize cytokine storm is the reason why mRNA cannot be used as a therapeutic agent. So they thought, they did this experiment and found out tRNAs are not giving that much response. So there must be something in tRNA which is not there in mRNA. That's the only major primary link that they made that led to the Nobel Prize, right? So, if you look at this is their first publication, probably this is the reason why they got a Nobel Prize. This was sent to big journals, they refused to take it, then they sent it to immunity, they published. I just wanted to show you this is a, uh, all that is not important, but what I just want you to see is uh, <coughs> the uh, various, these are all various cytokines that are totally absent when you make an mRNA with pseudouridine or any of these modifications. Absolutely no signal of the CNF alphas and things like that, interferon gammas, alphas and things like that. There was absolutely no signal. Which means that they imagine that tRNA because it has the pseudouridine as one of its nucleoside, they made mRNA with pseudouridine. That means replacing all uridines with pseudouridine and injected that into an animal. There was no cytokine storm. So the next thing is when there are so many other modifications that are not bringing cytokine storm, why did they choose pseudouridine? The next slide is that. Basically, they have done a much more detailed experiments and basically showing that the expression, for some reason, for some reason, replacing uridine with pseudouridine in an mRNA allowed much higher expression of the protein because expression of the protein is very important and also decreasing the cytokine storm. Here you see the decrease in cytokine storm because there is so much of interferons are produced but here with the, with the pseudouridine there is hardly anything and if you look at it the expression of the protein is very high. All I am trying to show here is 
they are trying to demonstrate that by replacing uridine in an mRNA with a pseudouridine, they are able to solve the problem of not triggering the immune system of the host, which is the primary reason why almost 30-40 years of work would never be translated into a technology. That's the key part of it. So pseudoiridin, this is what their, uh, 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 their thing. And if you look at these kind of vaccine types, all of us are familiar, probably some of you are at least, is, you know, there are viral vectors. The Serum Institute makes these viral vectors where they take the, in, in, in the context of COVID, there is a protein called spike protein. The spike protein is cloned into adenovirus vectors and express that adenovirus vector and give it as a vaccine. So that it gets into your body, makes the spike protein and the body thinks it's affected by COVID, it builds up the immune system and then protects you when actually you are infected. So that way you don't get the disease. You may get infected, but you may not get the disease. That's the trick in vaccination. So RNA, we just talked about it. Sometimes people take the whole virus, like what uh, Bharat Biotech does, they take the whole virus, kill it under UV, and then give it to us. So essentially they are giving inactivated virus to us. And there are also <coughs> subunit vaccines where they give the protein itself, like there are many companies that did this. So COVID pandemic, is this is the virus that we normally see, and this is the lipid nanoparticles of the mRNA vaccine. So as you see in this picture, the, the RNA is inside, and these are all lipids. There is a one particular lipid that has become very useful. We'll talk about it. This is the overall process of making the mRNA vaccine. The, you make the DNA, you design the DNA with this, in the case of COVID, you design the thing with the spike protein, make a plasmid in large quantities, give it a single cut, and then do what we call as in vitro translation. That means essentially use this template and make a lot of mRNA. While making mRNA, instead of uridine, you replace with pseudouridine. So your mRNA is only having pseudouridine. Now there are some, the design is involved, but I'll come back to you in the next slide. And then you linearize the plasmid, make the mRNA, pack it up in lipid nanoparticles, and make a vaccine. Very simple. I can tell you in a room like this, you can supply the whole country's requirement of mRNA vaccine. That means I'm talking about 1.4 billion into 1.4 billion, twice. Because the footprint of production of these ones is very small. That's one biggest advantage of mRNA vaccines is that you can make them with very little infrastructure, with comparatively little infrastructure compared to whatever other serum institutes or uh, Bharat Biotech has. Right, that's one. The second advantage is, like all of us know, COVID, as time passes, one becomes the other. Alpha becomes delta, delta builds, something else, Omicron and stuff like that. In a conventional, traditional vaccination system, the flexibility, the favorite word today is uh, pivoting. Pivoting to the new challenge is very slow because you can't quickly change the whole system to do something else. But that's not the same case with mRNA vaccines. You can change your vaccine in less than a month, very easily in the same setup. Because if you look at how Moderna has done, I think at the end of December 2019, the sequence of the Wuhan virus was made public by Chinese biologists. Within 30, 42 days, the first batch of vaccine is ready to be tested for human trials. That means, once you know the sequence, you know which is the most powerful antigen because there are other viruses that look similar. You know which protein is more important. 
synthesize the mRNA, make it because the Moderna and the other company, Pfizer, both are ready with it. In the sense, they have been doing this mRNA-based work for other issues like cancer, for rare diseases and all that. They have the entire platform ready, but they are all, there is no product. In fact, they are in debt. Both the companies are in debt. They took, in fact, Moderna raised $2 billion before they had any product, but they have a lot of promise. But the COVID came as a big testing ground and a boon. The moment COVID came and they saw, the they saw that it's going to be a pandemic, they switched all their pr production from that to this. So that's why they could do it. Normally, it takes several years for something to come up to a, a clinical stage. That is phase one trials, which is where you want to test it in humans. But here, they have done everything in 42 days because three weeks is what is required to do an animal study. All that is done. They made the, uh, the entire construct within less than a week, got into it, as I said, 42 days is what, in fact, they were fighting for both Moderna and BioNTech. It is an interesting thing. What they are doing is, uh, Moderna was supposed to give two doses four weeks apart. BioNTech is supposed to give two doses three weeks apart. So now they got into a fight on who goes first to the public by saying that we have done about one week. That was a kind of tight race they were running because there were only two competitors. They wanted to go first and create a kind of image that they are the first ones who solve the pandemic problem, whatever. So this is again simply the construct that I am talking about. This is a this is a DNA where the gene of interest is here, the coding sequence. You have five prime UTRs, untranslated regions, and also three prime UTRs. And uh, these structures, all of you know. There's nothing big deal about it, but I'm just showing this is what is part of your construct to make the DNA. And you make it, get rid of all the bad things in it while making it because when you're going, putting something in the humans, it has to be absolutely safe. So <coughs> the difference here is how do you send something inside? As I said, there is a guy by the name Felgner. I talked about cationic lipids, lipids with a positive charge. In fact, they have been, they were discussed, discovered almost 40, 50 years ago. They thought it is a great way to send molecules, DNA into the body, into the cells. But it never became successful because they are toxic. The toxicity is one reason, like almost like a cytokine, cytokine storm is anti for mRNA. This was a problem. So how this guy solved it, there is a company in Canada, Vancouver, run by one guy by name Peter Kulis, Arbutus company, where he understood this problem. And how do you decrease the toxicity? Remember, anything that goes to humans, whether it works or not to reduce a burden, it has to be first safe. If safety is not met, nothing goes crosses that line. Safety is the most important criteria in anything that we do. Whether it works, efficacious or not is secondary. And of course it's important. <clears throat> so safety, safety part of it, what this Kalis group in Canada did was, instead of putting a cationic group, they have put a thing, something similar to, if you know about histidine. Histidine has a group that becomes charged at low pH, that's around 4 or 5 pH, but not at neutral pH. What these guys have done, this particular molecule is the clincher. These are called ionizable lipids. That binds to RNA at a lower pH and when it, our body is at 7 plus pH, nothing happens at that point, so it's not toxic. So you make these lipids, lipid nanoparticles, of course it's not cationic, this is wrong. You take these ionizable lipids, mix them with other lipids and make it. So this composition is something owned by the Vancouver company. And what they do is, because remember, one of the challenges all of us face as scientists is many things work in our labs beautifully in controlled conditions well monitored but you want to scale it up 
scale it up means if the technology has to be useful at a larger scale, there are challenges. I can make very insulin protein kind of a thing probably in my lab very well, but I want to scale it up to 10,000 10, liters, 20,000 liters, the game, the game is different. Scale up is extremely important for something to be widely useful. So here also they came up with a method called microfluidics basically a kind of a method where you get a uniform lipid nanoparticles which are very good because they have to be a pharmaceutical grade they have to meet all those requirements so this company in you Canada has solved this problem so now I can make within a day liters of this thing because I'll give not more than 50 microliters for an individual so you can, I can make tons and tons of doses for in a simple system highly reproducible so this is what <coughs> the technology was solved in fact people said this guy Peter Kulis also should have been uh, nominated for Nobel Prize because his technology is as important as the pseudo-uridin technology but it didn't happen so this is a kind of a timeline mRNA is made in the labs tested in animals in 2020 it's authorized clinical trials sorry I'm, I'm coming this way uh, first synthetic mRNA produced <coughs> tested in uh, humans in fact this guy tested himself tested the uh, vaccine on himself actually for melanoma because it's a skin disorder various diseases are tried now finally COVID was an excellent testing ground and things were very good so this is a great story to listen to so this is I mean this lady is what we are talking about Kariko she started a company RNARX but she closed it after six years she worked in University of Pennsylvania she she asked University of Pennsylvania to give the rights to them University of Pennsylvania didn't do it because she didn't have much money she couldn't buy her own technology even though it's made by her so it University of Pennsylvania sold it to a company called CellScript okay they are for RNA for translation in cells and then this guy, uh, Pythar Kulis, is from Acutas and Arbutas, both the companies from Vancouver. He, sorry, there's a typo here, it should be lipids, ionizable lipids, he is what he has given him. And apparently Kariko was, Kariko has a daughter uh, who was an Olympian, won two gold medals in rowing. So in one of the trips she went to Europe along with the daughter and met these two people. Aslan Toresi and Sahin both are they settled in Germany they have been doing something they are also interested in mRNA technology for a long time they want the, this bio anti means bio pharmaceuticals new technologies that's their company it's still a small company they were raising around 150 million kind of a stuff and she raised $90,000 and Moderna raised two billion dollars so the kind of thing this is a scale of operation of various things so these people realized it is better to have her on her board so they took her as an employee she became a member of this one and they and it's as I said BioNTech is a small company they don't have the kind of scale up capabilities they went to Pfizer that's Pfizer because Pfizer is not interested in mRNA otherwise but Pfizer was agreed to partner with them to scale it up because they are very good at scale up Pfizer is a, a hundred or more than hundred year old company so they know they are huge setup across the world so they took it up so now that vaccine is called Pfizer BioNTech vaccine right that vaccine and Moderna vaccines are identical there is not much difference very little difference except for the buffer they use so this is the Moderna company these are all the big wigs of MIT Harvard kind of crowd this man is one of the most uh, they call him rock star in life sciences Robert Langer uh, he's very well known in uh, various biotechnology companies he must have had something like 
1,500 publications, some 400 companies, 600 patents, that kind of a crap. I mean, like, you can't really believe, because apparently if you, were you interviewing him, he won't even look at you because he'll be sending emails and talk to you. So that kind of a guy. So Robert Langer is one big guy. Derek Rossi also used mRNA, but his interest was not in vaccine. He was trying to do, you know, some of you may have heard of Yamanaka factors, which kind of move cells from, uh, you know, uh, the stem cells, right? To shift it from, instead of using embryonic stem cells, you can use the adult stem cells and then transform into something else, right? So he was thinking of transforming these, because you can't work with embryonic cells because there is a lot of restrictions. So he was using mRNA to deliver some of these factors to make them ESCs. So he was very excited, he was successful. So he went to these two guys, Timothy Springer and Bob Langer. They started the company Moderna with the help of this guy who has money. He is an investor. And they bought the UPenn cell script technologies on pseudouridine triphosphate and also Pythagoras, this thing, and employed this guy. Apparently, this guy is Stefana Benzel. At, when he was 28 years old, he was CEO of a, one of the largest company in France called Biomiro. And this man knows him and he wanted this company because Robert Langer believes mRNA as a vaccine is the next biggest thing in the world. When he did that, he impressed FAN. FAN impressed this guy. This guy is a kind of a, you know, uh, he creates a lot of rattle around, a lot of noise, a lot of things. As I said, he raised two billion for Moderna without having a single product in the market. But he can, he could convince people. And in fact, he, when the first dose of Moderna came, he injected into one of the CNN newsreader. Just to bring that kind of a, you know, big uh, splash news kind of a thing. You know, he's that kind of a guy. He's a poster boy and considered to be extremely smart in making things happen. And in fact, there's also a lot of controversies around him. When Modern are becoming popular, these guys are selling their shares, which is also legally, of course, not illegally. But that, these are the kind of things that happen when the money is big. So these are all the guys that made Moderna happen. The Moderna and BioNTech, these two companies, are brought in a technology that is, today we look at its value in vaccines, but it has got a lot of other values. In fact, if you look at it, there are almost more than, I think, more than 150 clinical trials for various diseases not only for infectious diseases, for cancer, for rare diseases, because you can replace an enzyme in the body. What happens is, in other cases where you have to replace an enzyme, for example, if I can replace insulin, uh, put some uh, mRNA of insulin in my body and keeps on making insulin, probably I don't have to take insulin shots. Beautiful. But does it work like that? Because whenever there is a repeated doses, Sometimes the toxicity comes into play and our own immunity acts against those things. These are all go ongoing uh, trials. But the point here is there is a lot of potential. Nowadays there is an mRNA that could be delivered, inhalable mRNA. Right? So this is something, uh, what I am going to show, what I am showing is what we have done in CCMB. Basically our, our team has done whatever Moderna has done, like you know, make the DNA, make the in vitro translations, make the LNPs. We have done our own jugard in getting the job done and then tested in animals, tested in hamsters, tested with COVID. Basically, we have done more than a year ago. But the point here is, why did we do it? Probably we are the first people in the country to do it, to show the entire workflow from A to Z. But the point here is, we wanted to take this technology to other diseases, which where we don't have issues with patentability, you know, if you do something in the same COVID, you may have issue, but you can do other things. So that is here, what it shows is 
if infected animal shows this much of load of virus, COVID virus, but when you give one of our vaccine doses, it comes down to almost five, four, five logs. That means 99.99% decrease in the viral load. And these experiments were done by somebody else, not by us, because we want to take out the subjectivity part of it. It was done by third party, in, actually in Institute of Science. Uh, they have done it. Great, great, great data, we were very happy with it. So, this also tells you the complexity of today's ownership of things. But still, how do you make it? If you look at these things, like <coughs> University of Pennsylvania made the pseudoiridin and uh, National Institute of Health made a particular uh, modification in the spike protein and uh, Acutas and Arbutas from Vancouver, they made the lipids. This is University of British Columbia is actually involved in making these lipids, gave it to these people and these people give it to Moderna and others. And there is this company called CureVac. What CureVac thought was, if uridine is a problem, can I reduce the uridine by modifying my nucleosides, the codons I mean. They tried to do it. If uridine is a culprit, can I reduce it? They tried doing it and they also have certain papers that say pseudoiridine is not the reason why things are working. I, we can talk about these things. But basically they said, if, the, if your RNA is very pure, pseudoiridine does not have a role to play in the cytokine storm. Nobody ever said that again, but the point here is there are so many other things that can happen. So, what you should understand is so many things have to fall in place and you should have the wherewithal to push it in the right direction. So, but this is another thing that you should remember, the impact. The, what it says is every US $1 invest in vaccine programs returned an estimated $20 in saved healthcare costs, lost wages and lost productivity according to whatever the decade of vaccine economics. These are all very standard publications. Using the value of a statistical life approach to model the value of immunization vaccine programs returned an estimated of $52 for every dollar invested. So, vaccination is extremely important. Even today, one of the reasons why the mRNA vaccines didn't come to India is because they're expensive. Not very expensive, but expensive enough. The second thing is, the suppliers did not guarantee insurance to the people who take the thing. You know, that's one clause the government could not agree with these suppliers that insurance came into play. So there are several things besides the cost and also India is producing our own, why bother to buy something else which is expensive. So India never went in mRNA di direction, but mRNA platforms are a powerful platforms for looking at other diseases because they are easy to make, they probably will be less costly. We can do many other things which we couldn't do with the traditional vaccine systems and different diseases can be brought in to look at. So these are all some of the pictures. I think this is a one, la one slide before the last. This is a lab. This is a Drew Weisman. This is a daughter when she grew up and when she became Olympian, twice Olympian and she used to work on her own because she didn't have money to take people and only this guy Wiseman made things happen, you can see Wiseman here too, make things happen with his own money to push Kariko's work forward because he believed in Kariko. So, this is a celebration on the day of the award at University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, one is chicken gunia. Of course, chicken gunia probably doesn't kill, but it can make you really morbid. Of course, the evergreen disease of India, TB, is also one of the targets that we look at. I'm sure he can add more to it, I guess, Raghu. But the point is the standard suspects.
Thank you, Dr. Rao. That was a very nice talk. Uh, your uh, mRNA platform, which you collaborated with the hamster study, some of the viral load after vaccine, the second dose and third dose were actually going up instead of um, coming down in the lung tissue. I was wondering about that. They are not different doses. They are different formulations. Oh, so they were different vaccines? Different formulations of the... Uh, Doses, it's like, for example, some places we give 5 micrograms, some places we give 10 micrograms. Okay. okay. And uh, also we changed, we used some of the local lipids. There is a company that makes these lipids. So we were testing whether we can replace the Moderna lipids with locally made lipids. And they also work well. So these are the variants. They're not dose variations. Okay. Sorry, they're not uh, uh, formulation variations. That makes sense. Thank you. They are good. Are you saying? Are you saying these are not statistically significant to these? These ones? Oh yeah. I mean, in fact, see, as I said, uh, I can't recall which one is what. As I said, the lipids that we used, either bought from Trilink or bought from locally and also the cap we bought the local cap and put it and wanted to see how it works so these are all cap and uh, the lipid formulation differ lipid differences other than the rest of the things are, chemically they are identical but sourced differently this one Uh, no, the, see, the decrease, if I can come back and tell you what are these different doses, I can tell you the 5 log has come down to the least is 0.5 log or something like 2 log. That means 1,000 fold decrease in the things. But these are all different formulations. Don't look at them as dosages of that. They are all taken at a single time point. And as you see here, sample collection in the week 6 plus 4 days after giving the tri the infection, four days after giving the infection, and collect the things and then look at the, by CT values, look at the numbers. And some of them are not as good as this, but the bottom line is they all worked. I just have a medical question. Uh, people uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, all Western countries took mRNA vaccines and uh, most of the Asian countries, particularly India, we depended on a vector vaccine and killed vaccine. Uh, Post-pandemic, uh, there are many cases of uh, embolitic, uh, em thromboembolism and myocarditis, cardiac failure, cardiac arrest, whatever it is. They were attributing a lot to mRNA vaccines yes. in contrast to traditional killed vaccines. So how do you comment on that? Is it true or only a, just a high? Uh, I can quote only papers uh, from either PLOS pathogens or, you know, these are top journals. Most of these studies are based on, they have done all over something like six, six lakh patients, not actually testing, but they looked at the records. Records maintained in the, not mostly in the Western countries, where the records are uh, kind of at a detail, and looked at the long COVID kind of symptoms for vaccinated or unvaccinated people. Among the vaccinated, they also looked at mRNA versus other vaccine platforms. The overall message is it did not cause any additional burden. That's for sure. At least I'm quoting from three, four papers. You can come up with some other paper and say it's not true. The bo bottom line is it is not so much of a problem as people thought it was the long COVID. One of the things that lot, probably it's my opinion is because something that didn't go through Actually, phase four details are also submitted to FDA recently, I mean almost last year, about what are the, after, uh, after you know, uh, giving it va vastly, what are the feedbacks that people have gotten. Those things were also good. The, because this, these vaccines have come through a lot of emergency approvals, did not go through the traditional one, of you know long term few years of testing and things like that there's always a suspicion 
but whether that suspicion is the reason for this kind of behavior i one can not say what i can say is if you go by very good publications that came away there be who or uh, you know nih and things like that because the work the the survey the analytics were done on uh, hospital records and the patient responses over a period of time because we had sufficient period now we are almost more than 2 years since covid so there is a long term history and there are continuous papers coming up people don't attribute it really to the mrna vaccine per se the long covid in fact they were much lesser in vaccinated people compared to unvaccinated people school of thought that says that the some of the side effects are because of the dna contamination in the vaccine itself and you alluded to this and say you have to remove all the bad stuff i'm guessing dna is some of the bad stuff how is that removed and is it possible that some people who had these side effects had it because all of that bad stuff Agreed. wasn't removed uh, removal is there are several i mean you know uh, the protocol is pretty long and then you make sure of you don't have endotoxins you have don't have double stranded rna dna nothing in the methodology because there are kits available to remove them and you estimate it by antibodies to make sure how much is removed those numbers are also available but that's one part and uh, what was i trying to get at was uh, so the the quality of the product is extremely important for the for the job as i said in fact i know how whether you were here that there was a japanese guy who spoke about it about uh, the capping of mrna you know some 3 4 months ago uh, most of the people capping is done by simply mixing the enzymes or the cap during the translation right he came up with data his data where he shows moderna mrna that is sold or used for vaccination is not 80% uncapped because in this process according to him there is no way of checking whether your rna is capped or not because the weight difference is so small you can't do mass spec on it so there was problems then he came up with another method that method uses a, a flag thereby he knows how much is actually capped when he used moderna method it was only as i said 10 to 20% cap so now you can question how capping is can be so low and still things work you know these are all the things that keep coming coming out like what you are saying the contaminants in fact as i said curevac logic is if you have a very clean material you don't need to do it naturally if you talk to robert bellon if you listen to him he also says that so but the bottom line is the whole thing worked so why can't directly we give a spike protein instead of mrna i couldn't still hear you we are actually administering an mrna which is coding for spike protein yes so why can't we directly administer spike protein instead that of also been done. the subunit vaccines are nothing but that so uh, are there any differences between giving an mrna vaccine and spike protein yes Um, like the uh, subunit vaccines especially they don't use the whole spike they use the the receptor binding domain rbd part of the spike they make only that part and give it to in in a particular formulation they give it to the body and it also works but here the efficacies are much higher compared to those things efficacy is higher let me tell you mrna is a new kid on the block others are also working there is nothing like there is something not working and this is only working the the neutralizing viruses work the adenovirus kind of platforms work and also and uh, neutralize these two are the main things even india was the first country to make dna based vaccine like so many things probably work it is just a matter of efficacy economics scale up these things actually Uh, kind of cut the cake also sir can we have a com- combined vaccine of uh, like a traditional indian uh, vaccine with an mrna vaccine will there be an increased effectiveness or it will be a normal uh, neutral people have done that too say for example in case of even icmr in a council of medical research has done the first dose being covaxin and another one is 
the serum institute one right they have done that so the protections are good there are mixed reports definitely it is not counterproductive right because in the end you are giving the protein which is important for uh, you know triggering the immunity then compared to the other vaccines there is any reason for it and see uh, any reason for why they are more effective yes there, that's no doubt as i said in my talk also they are 94 95% effective as others are around 90 i said don't look at these numbers too much but at the same time across the board they are more effective probably they they you know one of the advantages of mrna is it is short lived but it gives a very good spike of the antigen once it gets into the body that means it makes this spike protein very much and then probably that biology is people don't understand really why the mrna based vaccination has actually improved the the protection really okay the 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 immune biology is very complicated there are so much of studies that have been done on which cells are you know how people ask something very similar question like uh, how long the mrna vaccine induced protection last does it last for 6 months 1 year 2 years do how many times i have to take it do i take it every year these are all the things that are the data is coming up now the efficacy part there are so many reasons that could be there for mrna vaccine to be more efficient i i really don't have a reason but yeah one has to look up if there are no further questions let's thank dr madhusudan rao for his wonderful talk thank you thank you madhu for the great talk and also fitting in the talk in your busy schedule like i must tell you that we planned this session right after the prize was announced last week and madhu was insistent that we should do the talk asap like he was the one who told me that we should not waste any time in preparation and do it as soon as possible so thank you for that insistence and also i must thank all the colleges and some of the schools who have come to attend this talk i realize that many of you have exams going on or have exams coming up soon and yet you managed to come for this talk and engage with it so enthusiastically many thanks to all of you as well and before we leave the room i should thank iict auditorium for providing us the venue to organize this lecture today and instrumentation and it team from ccmb for for helping us with all the logistics and the aic ccmb team of the mrna vaccine raise your hand so that everybody knows who all are working on it <laughs> So as we will now head for the refreshments and you will head for it from the exit on your right and on my left uh, Grishma you might want to lead them towards that uh, we will be very happy for you to have the conversations running with Madhu or with the other mRNA vaccine team members here ask your questions and hopefully we'll be getting more curious together thank you very much <laughs>